Secondly, I uh, hope, inshallah, everyone the Ramadan went well. I think we went very fast this year, didn't we? Yeah. 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 And also, Allah had so much raham, so much raham, so much mercy. He gave us a little test on the first two days, I think, with the heat, yeah? I think for the rest of the 28 days, we're just saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. You know, with the uh, cold, nice, cool weather. It was summertime, and Allah had made it. Last year as well, the same thing happened. Just as Ramadan came in, the whole Ramadan became a cool Ramadan. And uh, we can only pray to Allah for another Ramadan like that. And if we get it, we're very lucky. And if we don't get it, that means some of us uh, have to burn our sins under that sun. Okay? Inshallah, however Allah wills, we'll, we'll have to do that. But inshallah, it was a very, it was a very good Ramadan, and also Eid went by. Uh, and hopefully, Allah, the, the main thing is, Please don't forget, the main thing is not the fact that we were up those nights, the last 10 nights. It's not the fact that we were, we fasted throughout the days. Not the fact that we stood up in taraweeh, or we did our du'as, whatever it was, we woke up a suhoor. It wasn't any of that. The main thing is, did we, or did we not get that accepted? And is Allah, or is He not pleased with us at the end of Ramadan? That is, that is something that we should be thinking about. Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu reported about him that he had, uh, he, he had spent Ramadan and he had spent it in the Haram. So he spent the Ramadan in the Haram of Makkah. And Sayyiduna Ali radiallahu anhu also did i'tikaf in the Haram. You can imagine doing i'tikaf is a big thing anyway. And doing i'tikaf in the haram and in the haram of Makkah, you can imagine how great uh, that is. And then you find that he not only did that, but he was continuously in, in Allah's worship. Their way of doing i'tikaf was that they took a little mat. And it's very clear in the Sunnah of the Prophet that they took a clear mat and they sat on it and that mat meant that they don't want contact with anyone else. They sat on it and they just worshipped Allah and no one should come. And this is from the, from the Sunnah of the Prophet So you can imagine how much worship he did. In fact, they say that, that Ramadan, he completed 60 Qur'ans. You can imagine how many Qur'ans, one by day and one by night. He was constantly reciting the Qur'an. And you can imagine the other things that Allah gave him tawfiq to do. So after finishing 60 Qur'ans, finishing Ramadan with the Atakaf, full worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and on the day of Eid, he's still in the Haram, and he's doing tawaf around the Kaaba on the day of Eid. And on that day of Eid, he's doing tawaf and he's crying. And he's crying, crying, he's rolling his eyes out. Somebody says, Oh Ali, why is it that you, you know, why is it that you just you finish this Ramadan in this manner and so on and you cry on the day of Eid? And his words were what? His words were Ma Abad Ma Abadan Allah Hakka Ibadati. I have not worshipped Allah as I ought to worship Allah. I have not worshipped Allah as I ought to worship Allah. And he also made the comment to the degree of whether this whether Allah will accept it or not. This is this is the thing. You know, they're, they're, these individuals they did so much, so much. You know, I mean, when we reflect on ourselves, sometimes. You think that, you know, we do a little bit and Alhamdulillah, Mashallah, Kesi, Mashallah, Bohot, Bohot, Echa, Sataish Firaat, Mashallah, 27 nights and 
You know, we start counting, <coughs> we know on the nights. We can say that it's that night or that night. And these, these individuals never had differentiation in the nights. All nights were the same for them. This was, this was one thing. Second, what, second is that even when we're up on those nights, we're doing, you know, part of it is going with tea breaks and chai and gup chap and talk. And then you've got a bit of uh, some other thing that is you know, happening on that night, maybe. And it's a mixture of things. Oh, yes, we get up for our eight rakats and that. And we feel that, you know, by doing eight rakats over, uh, by doing eight rakats over, uh, let's say an hour, let's say an hour, we kind of, some, some of us, I've, I've, you know, we can't blame ourselves if other nights we're not, we're not awake. If other nights we're not doing tahajjud. And if a person hasn't made themselves get used to the tahajjud and getting, making it longer for Allah's sake, then you're going to get tired after 45 minutes of standing. You know, sujood and ruku, whatever, after 45 minutes of standing or sitting or whatever, and also up to an hour or maybe one and a half hours, people really get tired. But the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, admaim, they train themselves. You know, it starts with a small amount and it carries on. They, they used to do lengthy, lengthy rakats. And it doesn't happen over one night. I'm challenging, you know, I'm, I'm saying to everybody, if we try and do that over one night and try and make the length of rukus and sujood they used to make, there's no way we'll be able to take it. But what it was, it was a challenge to try and see as much as they could do. So imagine that they, they did all of that, and they still are weeping on the day of Eid. You know, our days of Eid is full of, you know, laddus, baddus, and whatever else there is uh, to celebrate, and it's like, okay, Ramadan's gone. But these people are worried about, you know, whether it's going to be accepted. And, you know, that's something as a reminder for us to think about, because this is not... Uh, it's, it's not something that we just do and we expect from Allah that Allah is just going to you know, take it away and it's all going to be added on to our deeds. We have to be worried about our deeds as well. Anyway, um, <coughs> let that be a reminder for myself and for yourself as well. Today we decided, inshallah, we'll start off with tafsir of Surah, uh, a part of Surah Baqarah, a small part of Surah Baqarah, which is Ayatul Kursi. Now, Ayatul Kursi, I'm sure most of you know um, of this um, part of the Quran uh, of Ayat al Kursi. And Ayat al Kursi is one of those um, ayats of the Quran that has so much to offer. Because this, this ayah is just one ayah and it has ten small parts to it. But they're very powerful in terms of uh, you know, what they're delivering. By the way, um, I do apologize for the late notice about Ayatul Kursi that we're going to do tonight. It is my fault. Shabbi did email me uh, last week and I haven't got to it now. Alhamdulillah, we share. if we can share copies as well. It's been provided to today, but don't please take it granted that it's going to be provided every week. But, you know, there are costs towards these, um, to these uh, producers. So please, inshallah, what we'll do is for the next tafsir, which is in about three weeks' time, we'll email you in advance and it's your duty to copy them. Uh, from home and bring them, inshallah, to the masjid. Ayatul Kursi has so much to offer. One of the greatest things that Ayatul Kursi offers us is to get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, getting to know Allah and enjoying saying the words of Allah and saying Allah, you know, my, my brothers and sisters, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are people who worship Allah with their with their bodies only, and there are people who worship Allah with their hearts as well. There are people who worship Allah, and they worship Him by just placing their hands on the floor, and placing their foreheads on the ground. And there are people who worship Allah, and when they say something to Allah, even in the Salah, it, there's a feeling here in the heart, and it pours out. There's a yearning for Allah. It's, it's different. The, the closer that a person can get to the recognition of Allah, the higher uh, the, the person will be in, the state, in, in regards to the status of Allah. And the more sweetness, the more sweetness a person gets <coughs> in just remembering Allah. Now this ayah, Ayatul Kursi, is full of the dhikr of Allah. It's full of just the remembrance of Allah. And it's not only full of his remembrance, but it's full of his authority. And it's full of his, what he does for us and what he will do for us. What he, most, most, I think, is 
what he what he has done for, uh, uh, he has already done for us or what he is doing for us at this current moment this ayat is full of that and it's a great appreciation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the, in the way that he is dealing with us on a regular basis. Ayatul Kursi offers us protection. And I'm sure most of you know that, that it, is, it is a form of us getting protection from Allah. Now why is it protection? Why it's protection is because a person puts his full trust in what we believe Allah to be. And when you read Ayatul Kursi, it's not just, I'll, I'll be very, very straight with you. If you read Ayat al Kursi and you're asking for your protection, don't doubt. Don't ever doubt. Is it going to be protected? Is it not going to be protected? Never doubt. When, I, when I'm leaving, I mean, daily when I leave my house, I will read the, the, uh, the dua of the Prophet, given, which is in Abu Dawud and so on, which is Bismillah, tawakkal tu ala Allah. In the name of Allah, I leave. And I depend on Allah. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ There is no one to give the ability to stay away from sins or to do good deeds. There is no one to give that except for Allah. Allahumma inni a'udhu. Now that's, that's just that much if you say you've got protection. But you can also add another part. Which is Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min an adilla aw adilla. Oh Allah, I seek for your protection that I may slip, or that I may be made to slip from the right path. So I'm basically losing the right path. Or azilla or uzalla, or actually to trip, trip over. Or to, the first one is that I may be misguided, or, or I, may, I may misguide myself, or others might misguide me. Second one is that I may slip. Or azulima or uzulama, or that I may cause oppression on somebody else or that oppression may be caused to me or that I may uh, forget or be someone who is ignorant or I may fall into the trap of becoming ignorant by, by others this is a dua of the Prophet so like I said if you just say just that part Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah say that with me please Bismillahi tawakkaltu ala Allah when you say that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that a, and Jazakumullah khair brother, one brother just said nicely, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When I say, at least once, it is incumbent upon you at least once, that when I say Rasulullah, when I take the Prophet's name, you say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't have to say it every single time, but if you do say it, it's, it's definitely a reward, but at least once you must say it. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that when a person says that the shaitan actually looks at him and says, Wukita, you have been you have become protected from me. My harm will not come over you. The shaitan actually looks at the person coming at the door saying that and says that. But when I go for long term, I just read Ayatul Kursi. I've left at times, I'm still being true with you. In the past, so don't come to my house to rob me tonight. Um, I've left in the past thousands of pounds in an, in a place that is open, as in it's somewhere that you know if somebody comes to that place, <coughs> if they make a, just a small search, they will be able to find it. But I've left thousands of pounds, and I've just read Ayatul Kursi, and they've gone by, and not even bothered. And sometimes I've left it for months, and Alhamdulillah, nothing has ever come over. Uh, you know those nights that we had the riots in um, in uh, Ramadan, yeah? You remember? They called it the London riots. I called it the London looting. Yeah? It wasn't riots; it was just looting. But you know, to leave your car, especially when I was doing Tarawi this year, and it was down the road. I mean, one night there was all the police out there. Sorry, no offense to anyone from Edmonton, yeah, please. Um, you know, there's cars there, the shops that are all shut in the shutters before Tarawi. Atul Kursi, just pray, just pray, just blow, and just go. That's it. It's, it's the hifaba, it's this, it's this protection from Allah. Not only that, but any time, you know, I, I understand some people, I don't want to get, I don't want the whole lesson to go on to this next thing that I'm going to mention. And I hope I'm not dragged into a whole thing about this story and that story, but from jinns, right? From jinns, 
uh, Ayatul Kursi is probably the best form of protection. You know, um, just to just to say that, <coughs> just to say, that. and we're going to cover some ahadith and talk about this uh, this surah and its fadail or its virtues. But it's it's a very it's a great protection from jinns, especially from nightmares. If somebody suffers from nightmares, if somebody suffers from you know, anything to do with scary dreams, whatever way it is, you, you just pray out of kursi before you go to sleep. And you can even blow, if you want to blow in your hands and you pass it over your body, you can blow in your hands and pass it over your body. You don't have to do that, you can just say out of kursi itself and you will get a protection. If somebody wants to increase the protection, and I've given this to a number of people. Um, I heard a sheikh when I was young who gave it to somebody. And since then, anyone who's had this problem, like you go to sleep and you get, you know, you get certain people who get scared, they see dreams, they see things, or they might feel like they're being um, overpowered in their sleep. Um, you can start off just giving them out to kursi, and if that doesn't work on its own. Uh, and you know, when, I, when I say work, I don't mean the ayah doesn't work, please don't get me wrong. It's really the people's actions. Okay, and I'm going to come to that just a slide now, but you, allow me to get to that. If you read the <coughs> beginning of Surah Baqarah, from Alif Lam Mim, all the way to Ulai Kahum Muflihum, the first, just I think it's three verses of Surah uh, Baqarah, uh, three or four verses, sorry, of Surah Baqarah. So it's up to Ulai Kahum Muflihum. I'm sure most of you know that. And you read Ayatul Kursi, and you read the last two verses of Surah Baqarah. So you've got Amun al Rasul bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. From there to the end, if you read those three, or you tell that person to read those three, and they read it after they make wudu. Okay, they make wudu, and then they read these, and then they blow in their hands, they pass their hands over their body. Inshallah, bibna, nothing will come over them, nothing at all. Yeah. And I've, I've given you know, this, this method to many people again and again, and they they're Alhamdulillah, they have not had those dreams or those thoughts or those feelings, whatever. Now, where I say it doesn't work, I, I absolutely don't mean that the ayah doesn't work. Every ayah, every ayah, so the Fatiha for Shifa, so Ayatul Kursi for, for having person's protection, it is as powerful as it was in Rasulullah's time. There is no doubt in that. No one should have any doubt that the Quran is not working. No one should have that in their feelings. What it is, it is, is people's actions. So if you have a person who does their regular salahs and they use these ayahs for protection, there's going to be one effect. And a person who doesn't do their regular salahs and they recite this, there's going to be a different type of effect. Now we're not saying that somebody who doesn't pray, this will not work for them. I'm not saying that because I have come across many people who are on and off and they're praying or they're not praying and they've used certain ayats and certain things and Allah has given them the protection that they wanted. However, what I am saying is people who do pray, they're going to be more likely that their du'as will be accepted, the protection will be given to them if they were to take, carry these things out. And if a person was to pray and do other actions, nawafil, especially if they do extra prayers, so, for example, they give the zakat, but they give a lot of sadaqah. They've done the fard prayers, but they do the sunan and they do the nawafi. They've um, done the, you know, there they are people who control their tongue, or there are people who do extra things. You know, they look after the parents, yes, but they're, they're, they're kind to people as well, definitely. You know, other people that are around them. Once a person does the extra things, the more a person does in terms of actions, the greater the effect of their reading the greater the effect of their reading. Now, you can place this against black magic, you can place this against um, against jinns, you can place this against whatever you want to say, but it's one thing, the Qur'an has no degree less than what it was when it was revealed, and what it was before, and what it will be on the Day of Judgment, there is no difference whatsoever. Fatiha is the same Fatiha, and I'm telling you today, there are people around, who will be able to use Fatiha and they will be able to cure people from snakes poison just like the Sahaba did in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just as the same way there are people in the world still, I'm telling you this right now, there are people who will be able to just recite Ayatul Kursi once or some part of the Quran once and whatever they had, whatever problem this person <coughs> had, they go away. I'll share a story with you. Um, this comes 
from a story that from a very close person that I've known and a very close um, person I've known for several years. I've known the father, I've known the son, I've known the family, and so on. Um, they went to Bangladesh. Um, I think it was 20 years back, right? And the boy was young. He was the typical case. Dad wants to get him married off. Son doesn't want to get married. Okay, you know the typical case. You know, so whatever happened over there, the son didn't want to leave the man. But what happened is, the dad said to someone, some poor guy, <coughs> he mentioned as a joke that, you know, your daughter and my son wouldn't be nice. Wouldn't it be nice to, you know, go ahead. I probably mentioned it as a joke, that's what I've heard. <coughs> but then things weren't sort of, you know, the father wasn't really playing along. So the poor man got really worried. So what did he do? In desperate, you know, he really wanted his daughter to, you know, come over to his country. Yeah, of course, yeah. But what he did was something horribly wrong. He actually uh, went out and he got black magic done so that this son would actually marry his daughter. And then not only that, but I think another couple of people did the same thing as well because they all wanted, a, you know, a share of the little pie that could be, you know, come over to England. You become a rich person, and you know, hey, Presto, Jannah is there at your feet, yeah? Now, the complexity of this was that, you know, they, they, the son of this, of this particular father, his, his son was going crazy because of the effects of black magic and so on. And they went around to different, different shulua, different shares and so on. And some gave this, and some gave that, and some gave water, and some gave blowing, and some gave these. How is, what are they, you know, it just went on and on. They went to several different people, right? And I understand, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the whole debate of the old Taoist thing, which we talked about last year at some point, right? But if you have to, go, you know, please don't bring that up. And whoever's listening to this, don't say that I am, you know, saying yes to everything and I'm, you know, accepting all of this. But I'm just telling you what happened. So they went around and they went for several months. What had happened to this child is, this, this, you know, you could call him a, a teenager, you know, I think he was about 18 years old or something. He was not accepting anyone to marry. And it was this black magic that was casted on him. He had, all in all, and he had gone through so many shares. You know, when I had a word with the father, he said he went more or less to every possible one he could find. And then what happened is um, <coughs> he went to one particular sheikh. That sheikh is not alive now. That sheikh was known as the Sheikh of Renka. It was a mother site in, um, in Bangladesh, um, in Silet. Uh, there's a place called Renga. And in that there's a mother site. And this was a very, very you know, high individual, very high individual um, who, <coughs> who, who was very spiritually high. And this person, when, when the father came to him with his son's case, this person just did one thing. Others spent months, <coughs> weeks, whatever they did, this person just said, bring me a glass of water, <coughs> or a glass of water. He just read Surah Fatiha. He blew on the water, he said, give it to your son. He gave it to his son, and his son, after having that glass of water, completely was normal. The next one, the next, you know how many brides he saw in that, you know, it's a funny place. He saw in between that period, his father had shown him 57 brides to, to get married to. And he actually said no to all of them. And the village people actually said to me that it was really, it was ridiculous because they said, some of them, you just, you just, just looked at them once and you said, my God, you know, I need to get married, <laughs> you know. And uh, they were like almost, he said some of the exaggerated form, but they said some of them like, like they were fetched from Jannah down to this earth. And he said no. They couldn't believe that this person said no. But obviously it was, a, it was the effect of the black magic. But the, the fact that the part that I want you to you know, remember is that this one shaykh just read Fatiha, just <coughs> one blow of one water, and gave him to drink. And he drank that, and that was it. Everything was just gone whatever the case was, when others had spent a lot, and even though they're sheikhs, obviously every sheikh has got his, you know, stance with Allah and so on. It's the same as if you have 
if you have a person who's ill, you can have doctors that can see this person. But there's a specialist. And there are specialists, over specialists. So you will get a specialist of, let's say for example, someone's got uh, an earache or something, so they go to the GP, GP refers them on, they might go and get this done and that done and so on, and x-rays and blah, blah, whatever it is, MRI scan and so on. But there will be a specialist that will be a specialist for, you know, London. Then there will be a specialist especially for maybe Britain. But there will be a specialist for the whole of Europe. And then you might find a specialist that is, you know, a guy who's somewhere in the Western Hemisphere and he's the greatest sort of, you know, or one or two or three, you know, you know, individuals that are the most special individuals in that area. And if you go to them, they'll probably find one thing which all these other specialists under them won't find. So it's the same way with, with this. It's, it all, no, no, it, the Qur'an is the Qur'an. There is nothing, you know, less of the Qur'an that you can get. The Qur'an is full in its capacity. It's the people. It's us. And how we treat the Qur'an is our actions, it's our amal. And when we use, you know, when you use Ayatul uh, Kursi or you use Fatiha or something else, it's our amal. If our actions are good, and we all re always in the pleasure of Allah. That's that's it. He doesn't need any more uh, for the effect. So anyway, um, I will come to cer certain other ahadith which um, we've got about Ayatul Kursi. So we'll go to the board now. We've got a red mark. I said this version is it? There's a black one in the mouth. Okay. okay. Just let me show for you guys. No. Okay. I'll just write it down and the black mark will be fine. Okay, we'll do the um we'll do the verses now one by one, inshallah. I mean they're the parts of the verse. It's only one verse, but there are parts of this verse. Allah la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure many of you can't see this but We'll just do this now until the uh, marker comes. Allahu la ilaha illa hu al hayyul qayyum. So Allahu la ilaha illa hu al hayyul qayyum. If you're joining me together. Allah. The first part is just Allah. Just saying his name. First there is a recognition. There is just a recognition who Allah is. You know there is a, there is a hadith. It was, uh, it's one of the Israeli duayat. It's one of the Israeli duayat, which is that it was reported to us by a Sahabi who was previously uh, a Jewish individual who converted to Islam, and he knows the uh, scriptures of the of the old times. So Rasulullah mm -hmm. told us, "La tu wa la tu We said, "You may report them, but don't." Accept them 100%, as in believe in it 100%, but don't reject them either. Because if you accept them, they may have some untruths in them that you have accepted. If you reject them, there may be some truths that you've rejected. So he gave us permission to report these, but he did not give us permission to accept them in its totality and say, yes, they're completely right, or to reject them totally. And we confirm from those, if we find in our sources, whatever backs them up, we confirm them. So there is a, there is a um, uh, Israeli ruwaya where Ibrahim والسلام, he comes across um, a person, an individual, who is a, who is a lonely person. He's in the wilderness. And Ibrahim والسلام, comes across this person and this person says to him, like they have a conversation. Ibrahim alayhi salam finds so soothing when this person just names the just mentions the name of Allah. So Ibrahim alayhi salam says, please mention mention the name of Allah again. And this person, when he says Allah, he just fills the heart of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim alayhi salam then says to him that I could give you my entire sh the sheep that I've got, the flock that I've got, I'll give you all of that if you just mention for me again that word Allah from your mouth. Right? Because of the 
because of the, you know, it's, it's the, the, the faith a person has, the belief a person has. You know, it's not just Allah, Allah. But that, that they have these people who are close to Allah, they have this recognition with Allah. It's a deep understanding of Allah with faith and conviction. Allah, they have that conviction that Allah is there, He's existing. More so than my speech right now. You know, you are all, you're all accepting that I'm speaking to you right now. Allah says in the Holy Quran, this is more true than, than the ma uh, tanfiqun. The words that you are spreading with one another and having conversation, it's more true than that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just Allah, he wants us to say just Allah and then la ilaha. What's the meaning of la ilaha? There is no... Like Ilaha told you that, I think, before. What does Ilaha mean? Worthy of worship. And Ilaha can mean many things. One who is a deity, one who, is, uh, one, one who becomes a ma'abud, one who is worshipped, one who is served, one who has control over things, and so on. There's many, many different... But simply, we put it as there's no one really worthy of worship. Illa who? Except for him. Who? Except for him, he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one but Allah. Now the first recognition of this verse is that Allah, you are the one. You are the one. There is no one, there is no one that is worthy of anything. Except for you. Except for you. And if you think about it, subhanAllah, la ilaha illallah. Just now you think of how many things Allah is doing for us, just for us to sit in this place here. And just listen to this. There are millions and millions of things Allah is doing for us at this moment. Millions of things. If you were to start counting, you wouldn't be able to count. And they say recognition of Allah. Al Hay Al Qayyum. These are two words, two two names, two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the scholars have said that they form they form the Ismul Awam. There are certain people who have said, certain scholars, great scholars have said, that they form Al Ismul Awam, which is the greatest <coughs> name. If anyone takes this name and calls Allah, then whenever they call him, anything they ask for will be given to them. And they say, some have said from a hadith, they have pointed out that this is these are the names. So Al Hay, the one who is ever living. The one who is Qayyum, one who controls all affairs. Now, there's a deep meaning to these things. Al Hay means that Allah has always been there, existing, with His knowledge, with His, with His knowledge, with His will, His knowledge. His will and with His Qudra, His power. I mean, Allah has always been there. there. There has never been, there has never been a moment or time or anything that has preceded Allah, and there will never be anything that will come after Allah, but Allah is there. There is no such thing as when did Allah come. I understand that some people can get this waswasa. I've been asked this several times. You know, sometimes the shaitan plays. Uh, and Rasulullah said this in various ahadiths. He says, the ultimate whisper of the shaitan is, فَمَنْ خَلَقَ اللَّهِ Who created Allah? The ultimate whisper of the shaitan is, so who created Allah? And the simple answer to that is, yep, you say to yourself, to yourself, you say, oh, pee in a brain. Yeah? You say to yourself, you pee in a brain, you dirt piece of filth. That's what you say to yourself, yeah? When you hear that, you say to yourself, whoever you are inside me that's asked that question, you must be the most dumbest person that I've ever come across. You know, say that to Shaitan. You know, he gives you he gives you whispers. Call him, call him a few things, yeah, that you can say to him. You give him a few things, yeah? Love, yeah? And what you say what you say to him is you pee in a brain. How is it that me being who I am 
who can't even comprehend what even my own body is. Up to now, scientists haven't even found, you know, there's so much to the body that they haven't still discovered. How can I, as a person who the scientists have told me that I only use 10% of my brain like every other human being, which is true, right? How much of percent of your brain do you use? Like you don't even know that. <laughs> How much percent of the brain do you use? Is it five? Have they reduced it to five now? I think it was 10 to 15, but anyway, if you're saying that they've reduced to five. If you're using that much of your brain and you don't even know how much of your brain and why it's there but it's not functioning, or whether it is functioning but you don't know which way it's functioning, if that is the case, how, if you don't know about your own self, how are you supposed to comprehend Allah Azza wa Jalla? It's just impossible, absolutely impossible. I remember one share saying, he said, if you ask somebody to lift up one kg, if you ask somebody to lift up one kg, can you lift up one kg? Yes, guys, come on. Yeah. Bag of sugar, one kg, yeah. If you're told to lift up 10 kg, yes? Yeah, yeah good, good. 20 kg? Yeah. Yes, 30 kg? Yeah. Yes, I think some of you still can here yeah, because you, you take them on holidays, right? Come on, I'll back up. That's not the kg. Come on. Yeah? Right. Um, then, if you say, well, let's move it to 50 or 100 or 200, let's, let's take it to 1,000. At one go, lifting 1,000 kg, again, it's impossible. Taking it to 10,000 kg is going to be absolutely impossible. So, the same way that Sheikh said, he said, the same way. He said the brain has got a certain capacity of how much it can calculate and how much it can think. It's got a limit to it. There's a limit to the physical body, there's a limit to the actual <coughs> brain. And the, abs the honesty is, you just have to admit that Allah has not asked you to ask you even ask that question, to be honest with you, or even go to answer that question. <coughs> because he is way beyond, he is way, a, a hurricane is way beyond us calculating it. Just a hurricane. You know, there are researchers, there are machines to calculate the powers of a hurricane, how it starts, what's happening, <coughs> the functionality of it, from the clouds right down to the seas, right? Just a hurricane. <coughs> Let alone, to, and that's just one makhluk of Allah, that's just one, just one creation of Allah. A whale. A whale is beyond man's capacity to understand of its, you know, just, just what it is. And how, how it functions and so on so on. And you can go on. That's just one makhluk of Allah. If you go to the ocean, the ocean itself has never been discovered fully. Till this day, you can, even the earth hasn't been discovered <coughs> in its full extent. Even man hasn't been <coughs> discovered to its full extent. We, no, human being, DNA, they just found out in the 1950s. Or they're still carrying on, carrying on, carrying on. They're finding more and more. They've only cracked the gene code just, I think, last decade. They've only just cracked it. And it just, they've only just started again a new game. What happens if you put this gene with that gene and that gene with that? If you take this gene away, what happens? I mean, they're just starting a new phase of understanding the human being. And that's the human being. And you think about the thousands of creation of Allah. And Allah is showing us that you can't <coughs> even comprehend and fully understand my creation. Forget it. Don't even ask the... Don't even ask the question about that creator. It just goes to show, you know what all of this shows, shows you? It shows Ijz. Or Ijz is. Ijz is inability. Ijz is when Allah strikes us and makes us feel like we are totally incapable of doing anything. When you look at, when you look at Allah's creation, you feel like I'm totally incapable of even working this out. <coughs> if I can't work all this out, how am I supposed to work about the Creator Himself? There's no question to it. It's just logical. So Al Hayy, ever living. Al Qayyum controls all affairs. Okay? Now Qayyum comes from a word with Qama, which means that it means to stand, but it also means to take control. And there are, there are <coughs> different uh, meanings of uh, Al Qayyum. Uh, the different tafsirs of Al Qayyum. People, in terms of their their lives, 
Allah has full control over their lives, their actions, Allah has full control over our actions, and their rizq, in terms of what Allah provides, Allah has full control of it, and that's part of what it means by being Qayyum. Another part of what Qayyum means is that Allah protects us. This is one part. Why this, uh, this whole ayah, ayat al kursi is an ayah of protection is because Qayyum itself is a way of, a, a way of understanding Allah being the protector. So he protects us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, أَفَمَنْ هُوَ قَائِمٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ This Surah Al-Ra'ad, Surah number 13, verse number 33. Think about, Allah says, what about the one who is above every single soul and what it has actually done and committed? There is no way any one of us will be able to even twitch an eyelid or even move a nerve in our body or even move a finger without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, knowledge and his irada, without him willing us to do it and without him giving us the power to do it, without him providing us the means to do it. And that is what Qayyum is. We put our full trust in Allah. So already we have said, Allah, there is no one. Now look, look what we're doing to ourselves when you're reading Ayat al-Kursi. Next time you read Ayat al-Kursi, put these in your mind. We're saying, oh Allah, Allah, as if nothing else exists. Just that, just that word on its own. It's not, even, it's not even part of the sentence. You can put it just on its own. Allah, just you. As if you really think about it, it's just Allah. Everything is, everything is controlled by Allah. So it's just Allah. La ilaha, there is no one that is worthy of worship, no one who has any control or anything except for you. One of the meanings of ilah is the one who also has uh, an authority. So there's no one who has authority except for him, meaning Allah. al Hay. you've always been there. You've always been there. You'll always be there. And you're always in control. You're always protecting. We've so far said this. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al qayyum la ta'khudhuhu la ta'khudhuhu sinatun wa la nawm Now we're saying furthermore you know when there's a guy who's protecting um and there's a really nice bounce or something there's a really nice bodyguard or guard or whatever it is what limitations have you got for that guard If it's a human being you know the limitations you give him a few hours, he's going to need to sleep. You just give him a few hours, he's going to sleep. If you've got a computer even, a computer that serves to protection for your you know, viruses that are coming, what happens after a while? What do you have to do to the, to the virus, anti-software and antivirus software that you've got? What do you have to do? You have to upgrade it, you have to update it. What happens if you don't upgrade it? It's going to start to give in and you know virus it will come on the computer not only that but your computer if you don't carry on rebooting it what will happen crash it's gonna crash it's gonna get slow and so on one thing with this guardianship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that there is no neither slumber or you can say yawning or having a tired tiredness not no tiredness and no sleep None of this will, will take seize of Allah. This does not seize Allah. Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never, in, in having control over his entire creation, at not a single moment, will Allah be unaware of anything that is happening. It's, it's beyond our comprehension. The Quran says, مَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ a single, imagine right now, it's autumn time, autumn time, right? It's autumn time. The leaves, what's happening to the leaves outside there? What's happening to the leaves outside there, come on? They're falling. They're falling. <coughs> and so, how many are falling of one tree? How many? If I give you, ask you for a number, yeah? Will anyone be able to give me a number? I mean, a guy can start looking at a tree and making the research and saying that, you know, in the last past hour, past two hours, this many leaves have fallen. Allah SWT in the Quran, he has said, مَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ In the whole world, in the whole world, with all the trees, imagine how many trees there are just in Palmer's Green. 
on the whole of the world, all the trees, wherever there is a leaf that is falling, it doesn't go beyond my knowledge. Every single leaf that is falling. And subhanAllah, the knowledge of Allah is, when that leaf was coming out the bud, before it came out, Allah knew the moment it's going to drop. And Allah not only knew the moment it's going to drop, but He knew exactly how it's going to drop, how it's going to twist, and which part of the earth is going to fall. And not only fall on the ground, but how long it will take to decompose and to deteriorate and to move into small crumbles and go back into the earth. Not only that, but how, what will happen to the, to the parts of that leaf in the ground? So Allah says, مَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا And He says, وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلْنَاتِ الْأَرْضِ there are so many seeds in the ground that we are unaware of. Allah says, I know as many seeds there are in the whole ground that are created across the entire world. In the, dar in the darkest, the deepest parts of the earth, where these seeds are just lying there, just dead, I know where they are. There's nothing in the whole world of any moisture parts wet parts, but I have an entire count of, and I know exactly how many there are. Nothing that is dry on the earth, but I've got a count of it. That's why one, one Bedouin came and he made a dua, and this was a dua that the, uh, the Aslaf took up. He, he said, he said, you have, the, uh, you have the knowledge of what? You have the knowledge of Al-Jabalu wa ma I think it's Wari, Wal Bahruma, Fi Kari, Wala Tuhitus, Wala Yuhitu Kasama Un Samaa. Oh Allah, you have the knowledge of the mountains and the weight of the mountains. And you have the knowledge of the oceans and the vastness of the oceans. And there is no sky that will keep you under it, for you are the one that covers all. That is the way that he describes Allah. There's a, there's a beautiful dua that he said. So nothing, nothing will take seas Allah. Wa la taqusirat wa la nawm. And then Allah says, well, not in protection, but everything actually belongs to him. Now imagine, the next part of Allah is saying is, is lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al If you own something, and it's fully in your control, You have got nothing to fear from. Nothing to fear that Allah will not be able to do it for you. Now, your part, let's say for example, my part in my, um, in my house, my shares, my land, my property, my this, my that, whatever you've got. What is that compared to the entire heavens and the earth? What is that? Come on. Not even a particle. Allah says, Forget me protecting you. I already protect the entire heaven and the earth. Your belongings, your family's belongings, your neighbor's belongings, whatever I have already got all of that. Lahu, what does Lahu mean? Lahu means? For him, ma fi samawat, ma is whatever, and fi samawat. Is in the heavens and art, or whatever it is in the earth. Alhamdulillah, Jazakumla, at least you've done some Arabic over the last year and you're remembering some of the words. Makes it easier. Lahu ma fi samawat wa ma fi al-ard, man dhalladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi idni. Allah says that no one crosses me. In my authority, in my kingdom, I am the one that I have full power. And some people, Allah says, you can put your trust in anyone you want. We have faith that on the day of Jesus, Allah took one part, he took a very important part. That part was that if there's anything that people might be looking at, someone who's next to Allah. So who's, who is amongst the human beings, who is the greatest of all human beings? Rasulullah. Rasulullah. And what's the greatest thing that Rasulullah will do for humanity? Intercede. Rasulullah for the grip for all humanity. He's going to do one thing which no other person in the entire creation from Azman to last will be able to do. 
which is that he will be the first to intercede on the Day of Judgment. And Allah will give him that power. Now, in the hadith, it says, <coughs> the hadith, it says, in the hadith of Bukhari, it says, Aati um, al arsh I will come under Allah's arsh. فَأَخِبْرُ sajida And I will fall into prostration. This is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling us this. فَيَدْعُونِي مَا شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَدْعَنِي Allah will leave me in that position of sujood under the arsh for as long as he wills. ثُمَّ يُقَالَ And then it will be said to me, اِرْفَعْ رَأْسَكْ Lift your head up. وَقُلْ تُسْمَعْ And say, and it will be heard. وَشْفَعْ تُشَفَّعْ And intercede, and your intercession shall be accepted. قَالْ فَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him a portion. He say, Allah will say, فَيَحِدُّ لِي Allah will say, well, this much portion you're allowed to make intercession for them and allow them to go to Jannah. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's taking the greatest human being and the greatest act that he will do on behalf of the entire creation, but he reminds us and he says what? He says, مَنْ ذَلَّذِي عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ Who will dare who will dare make an intercession and intercede except with his permission, with my permission? Allah says, not even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not even any man, or any human being, any woman will have the authority on that day of judgment to make that shafa'ah. Who is the Zalladi means the one who who is the one who Alladi, the one who will Yashfa'u will make intercession <coughs> their judgment. Illa bi ibni. Except with Allah's permission. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said once uh, to us uh, he said that we must not rely on our actions. He said, None of you will be able to save yourselves from the fire or from Allah's wrath. You will not be able to save yourselves with, through your actions. So the Sahaba عنهم, said, Messenger of Allah, even you, are you saying that you will not be able to save yourself from Allah's fire through the actions that you have done? And he says, he said, Wala ana, not even me. إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدِ لِيَ اللَّهُ بِفَضْلٍ مِّنْهُ وَرَحْمَةٍ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that only if Allah encompasses me, surrounds me with his bounty and his mercy, then only will I be able to find my own salvation. Otherwise, I have no salvation in the day of judgment. So yes, we admire, we adore, we love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we have faith in his shafa and intercession but we realize it is only through Allah's permission that he will gain shafa. So what does this do? This teaches us that none of Allah's creation should be dependent upon except for Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah is the one that we depend upon. No one else. <coughs> Now, the past and the future. Baina aidihim means in front of our hands. Khalfahum means behind our backs. What that means is khalfahum. Baina aidihim is something that we've already done, we've already committed. Khalfahum is something that is, is happening, is going to happen in the, in the future. Now, I know um, uh, th th this is a part to say that whatever your past is, whatever your future is, all of that is within Allah's knowledge. So imagine, imagine, okay, imagine I want to have, to gain something from Allah. There's a, there's a beautiful ayah in, um, and all ayahs are beautiful, but there's just, with regards to this thing that I'm saying, there's an ayah in uh, Surah Az-Zumar, in the 39th Juz of the Quran. It's a very simple verse, but it sums up what we're saying here. Allah says, أَلَيْسَ اللَّهُ بِكَافٍ عَبْدَهُ 
Alaysa Allah. What does Alaysa Allah mean? Alaysa Allah. What does it mean? Isn't Allah. Thank you. Alaysa Allah. Isn't Allah. Be kafin. What does kafin mean? Enough. Thank you. Kafin. Enough. Abdahu. What does Abdahu mean? His servant. Allah is saying, isn't Allah enough for his servant? Isn't Allah enough for his servant? You know there are people who actually spend time, um, there are people across the world who do this, and maybe you've got relatives who do this. Right? There, are, there are people who, they just don't have the full trust. So what they will do is, they will start off with, you know, okay, turning to Allah and so on. But they will end up going to other people. They will end up going to even the graves and asking for things, you know, from people who are dead, from the awliya's graves and so on. And they will go from one to another. And I pity these people. I know there are those who say and they talk about the barakah and the blessing or whatever it is. But you know what? End of the day, there is pity for these people because and there's pity for people who rely on other things. You know, they just can't get enough. They will, they will ask for, give me this, and give me that, give me that, give me that, and give me that. I'm, I'm not saying don't take these things to read. Yes, there are ayats in the Quran that Allah has told us to read and so on. But I will be honest with you. <coughs> From experience of people who have <coughs> gone through this, the moment we turn to Allah and we put our full trust in Allah, that there is no one else except for you, it works. There's nothing more workable than that. There's nothing more workable than that. Just to put full trust. Now, subhanAllah, Allah has given us so many examples in the Qur'an. So many examples in the Qur'an. <coughs> to put the full trust in Allah. So Allah is saying that your past, your future, I know it. I know what's going to happen to you. Put your trust in me. I can change your future. Put your trust in me. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ So, أَيْدِيهِمْ means... Um, what is in, in front of our hands, khalfam is what is behind us. So whatever it is, whatever it is that you've got, put your trust in me and I'll make it work for you. Can I just ask what time Salah is? Is it 9? Mm -hmm. So you've got, we've got the Aidihim which is in front of us. We've got khalfahum which is behind وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا لَا يُحِيطُونَ means they do not. This is, a, this is something to think about. SubhanAllah, you know, you think. What do you think the people of, what do you, what do you honestly, you know, it's sometimes so beautiful to think about. The people who were around 100, 200 years ago, right, they thought they all had it. Yes or no? They thought they made the most advanced things that you could think about when they first probably made the, the steam engine, when they first probably made the rocket, when they first made the plane, when they first made They thought, that's it. You know, take yourself back in that time, you think, that's it, there can be nothing greater than this discovery that we've made. And you think about the discoveries today that have been made, right, about atoms. Not only that, but you think about the discoveries made into what we know about the space and what we know about this world and the technology that will come out. And imagine taking, you know, imagine taking a phone out and showing it to a person who is 100 years old. You want to think, what? What should I do with this? Whack it over your head or what, you know? What do I do with this? And if you showed him inside here, if you showed him inside here what it actually has, he wouldn't understand. But when he would understand, he'd think, my God, how? It'd be miraculous, absolutely miraculous, to have light showing on a phone with information across the whole of the world. How? It's absolutely baffling. But you know what? We think we've got it all. And Allah's going to show us dumbfounded in the next 10 years, next 20 years. He's going to make us feel so old. You know, the 80s, you think about the 80s, right? Some of you were around in the 80s, yeah, like myself, yeah? 80s look old, seriously. 70s look even older. 90s looks old right now. Yeah, you know, 
down here we were having the first connections of the web and all that, and the computers were going mad with Windows all over the whole world. Yeah? That was just the beginning. You think about it, the zeros came, now that's going to start looking old. And every decade that is coming, something that is coming new, and you think, subhanAllah, something else is coming out and is completely dumb, completely leaves you, leaves you dumbfounded. How is it that people are able to make judgments about Allah when they have not even concluded their, their ilm and their knowledge of Allah? You know, no matter how many scientists you have there, no matter how many universities, no matter how many philosophers you've got, you know what? You could, you could take this part of the verse and you could laugh in their face. Because Allah says, La yuhitun they, they do not surround Allah. With not even an iota, not even a thing of his knowledge. Yeah? Not even a part of his knowledge. They don't even surround a part of his knowledge. Yeah? You, think, you, think, you think we've got just a nerve, we've worked out a nerve. Allah's going to show us in a few years time that there's more to a nerve than what was understood. And then you go deeper and you go deeper. You know, the human being is just miraculous. You go deeper and deeper in the studies. In every part of the human being just brings you a new whole thesis, new whole part, new whole field of study and knowledge. Allah said, you haven't even surrounded a single iota of what I've got. How dare you, how dare you feel that you've overcome me in some way? that which Allah wills. If Allah gives you knowledge, then fine, you've got knowledge which Allah wanted you to have. Otherwise, you don't have any of that. وَسِحَا كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ You've got the papers in front of you. I'm just going to read out the translation that you've got for the paper. وَسِحَا كُرْسِيُّهُ His, what did you say? His kursi extends over the heavens and earth. His kursi extends over the heavens and earth. Now, what is his kursi? Now, in Arabic, kursi literally means chair. It means chair. But we do not say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a chair like the one that me and you are sitting on right now. There's no way we use such blasphemous statements about Allah. Neither does it mean that Allah ever sits. Please make, let me make this very clear. When we talk about Allah's arsh, when we talk about Allah's arsh, his throne, throne does not mean that he is a God that sits on that throne. No way. No way. Even the fact that you know, the, the, whichever shape that throne is, gives no, there's no way we can think of Allah as a God who sits on a throne. Allah has nothing that surrounds him. Allah does not fit into anything. Allah is way above all of that. We cannot conceive Allah in that same manner. So why did he use these words? He used these words for us just to believe in them. There are certain verses that you just have to believe in. Secondly, if you're going to use any form of uh, interpretation for these parts, you have to follow what the Salaf and the predecessors have used. So for example, Ibn Abbas anhu, and also his student Mujahid, both of them have explained this word kursi as being ilm, as being knowledge, which would de then translate to his knowledge covers and completely surrounds the whole heavens and the earth. Allah's so knowledge covers everything that is in the heavens and the earth. Some have said that it is Qudra, his power and other things, which is very similar. But if some have said no, it is actually a kursi. It is something that we can't say it's, we can't say it's a chair or something like this. But we know that it might be anything which Allah has called a kursi. Something, whatever he means by kursi. And in comparison to Allah's arsh. Okay, uh, let me just make sure that we're not getting a run. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Arsh. Arsh is Allah's throne, and Allah's throne is much greater than his kursi. The ulama of tafsir have made that very clear. Arsh of Allah, can you hear me down the back? Yes? Okay. Arsh of Allah is his throne, and his kursi is something smaller in size, but we don't know how it looks, and we don't know what it what it has, but we certainly know that Allah has used this in the Quran, we must believe it. And also the fact that it shows authority, that's it. It shows complete authority. So in this verse later on you will see the word Arsh. And the Arsh actually refers to the throne and it means full authority over his entire creation or whatever he has created. So, وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَؤُدُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا 
Hibs means to to look to protect. Hibs means to protect. Now sometimes you have a person, okay, they protect their God and so on, but sometimes you can feel feel <coughs> fatigue. Okay, Allah said there's no fatigue in this in this matter. But sometimes a person can get burdened by looking after something. Allah says that by looking after the heavens and the earth, both the heavens and the earth, looking after them to protect them, Allah says, La ya this does not burden me by the least. And then Allah says, Allah is most exalted, most high, and He's He's the the, the greatest, <coughs> or He's great. Now, this this uh, whole ten parts of this verse we've done, it's all about Allah. It's all about the greatness of Allah. It's all about the power of Allah, the protection of Allah, Allah's guardianship, and so on. Now, I'm going to quote to you certain hadith, which give us more benefits of Ayatul Kursi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was asked um, Sorry, let me just cover this hadith in order Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said uh, and this is from Abu Umama radiyallahu anhu and it's up to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this is the hadith I'm basing upon uh, this is uh, um, Ismul Azam Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that Ismullah al-Azam, Allah's greatest name that when he is asked by this name he answers the call it is in three different verses uh, Surah Al-Baqarah wa Ali Imran wa Taha. It is found in Surah Baqarah, it is found in Surah Ali Imran, and it is also found in Surah Taha. As for Surah Baqarah, it is this verse here, Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. See the words, in all these three verses they are referring to, the words al-hayyu al-qayyum are repeat, repeated. So in, Alif, in, in Surah Ali Imran, the first, uh, sorry, the second verse, Alif la mean Allahu, La ilaha illa wal hayyul qayyum. Again, al hayyul qayyum appears there. And then you find in Surah Taha, Wa'anatil wujuhu lil hayyul qayyum. All faces on the Day of Judgment will be in complete surrender uh, to Allah. They will surrender to Allah, they will be submitting themselves to Allah. So that's again, al hayyul qayyum is mentioned. Now, if you want to get a dua answered, it is good to repeat these names. Ya hayyu ya qayyum. Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum Ya Hayyu Ya Qayyum and some in one of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's du'as is Birahmatika Astaghith in your, in your mercy do I put my full I seek my protection on Allah through your mercy so this is one hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a separate hadith he said Sayyidul Kalami Al-Quran the best of speech is the Quran wa Sayyidul Qur'ani Al-Baqarah and the best, and the highest, and the most supreme, or the leader of the Qur'an in one way is Surah Baqarah. Wa Sayyidul Baqarah Ayatul Kursi, and the best part of Surah Baqarah is Ayatul Kursi. In a hadith of Nasa'i, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Man qara'a Ayatul Kursi dubra kulli salah. Whosoever will recite Ayatul Kursi after every fourth prayer, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be in full protection of that individual. So you'll protect yourself from that fard salah up until the next fard salah just by reciting surah, just by, by reciting Ayat al-Kursi. In another hadith of Nasai ibn Habbana, this is a sahih hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whosoever will recite surah Baq, uh, sur, 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 whosoever will recite Ayat al-Kursi after every fard prayer, Nothing prevents him from going straight into Jannah except for death. Death is the only thing that's prevented, meaning that as soon as death comes, he will go straight into Jannah. The Sahih Hadith in Ibn Hibban and also in Nasai. And again, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, he reports from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, I heard your Prophet saying, and he was on the member saying that whosoever will recite Ayat al-Kursi after every father prayer, then nothing will prevent him from going to Jannah except for death. 
and no one will continue to recite Ayatul Kursi and holding God to it, meaning that you continue to do that every single, after every Fard Salah, except for one who is absolutely truthful, a Siddiq or Abid, or one who is most worshipping of Allah. And <clears throat> whosoever will recite it, whosoever will recite it, when they come to their bedside, Allah will protect his soul, his body, and Allah will protect his neighbor, and Allah will protect his neighbor's neighbor, and Allah will protect all the houses around him. This is from a, a separate hadith. There's a beautiful hadith um, by Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu in, um, in Bukhari. Right, um, <clears throat> this is a hadith in Bukhari where Abu Hurairah anhu says, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he put me in charge of looking after zakat al-fitr. You know the uh, zakat al-fitr we gave at the end of Ramadan? There's the money that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, look after this. So he said, a person came to me and he started to take some of the food away <coughs> without permission. So I, could, I took hold of him and I said, I will take you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, and report you to the Prophet So this person said to me, said, leave me please, I really need to, I'm in desperate need, I've got family and I've got a great necessity to take this food, I'm very poor. So he said I left him and I came to the Prophet and subhanAllah, Allah had given that knowledge to the Prophet without Abu Huraira telling him. So Rasulullah turned to Abu Huraira and said, oh Abu Huraira, what happened to the person that you called last night? What happened to that person? So he said, I said, Messenger of Allah, this person, he complained that he's got great poverty, he's got family, so I had mercy on him and I let him go. So Rasulullah then said, <clears throat> he, you know, he's just lied to me and he's about to come back to you again. So he said, I knew from the words of the Prophet that once the Prophet has said to you that he's going to come back, he's going to come back. So I waited. And I waited until he came back and he started to dip his hand again into zakat al the, the, the uh, different flower, whatever was donated for the poor people. He started to put his hands in there. So I took hold of him and I said, I'm going to report you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And the person said, let me go please, I'm in need, I've got family, I've got great poverty, I'll never come back. So I had mercy on him and I let him go. And then a third time this person came and he then did the same thing. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I went after that back to the Prophet and I said, he said, Oh Abu Huraira, what happened to the person you called last night? And I said, Messenger of Allah, I let him go, he complained about poverty, he complained and I had mercy on him, and let him go. Prophet said, you know, he's coming back. So then he, I waited for a third time, and this person came back and he started to take scoops of the food, and I caught hold of him and I said, I will take you to the Prophet I will report you to him. And this was the last time that this person <coughs> this, um, came. He said, I keep on catching you. I keep on catching you and you still continue to come. And then this person was caught by Abu Huraira. And Abu Huraira was serious to take him to the Prophet So this person said, Dani u'allimka kalimati an Allahu biha. He said, please allow me. I'm going to now, I'll teach you something. It will really benefit you, but just let me go. So I said, well, so what are those things that you're going to teach me? So this person said to me, he said, when you come to your bedside and you, you're about to sleep, recite Ayatul Kursi until you get from the beginning of Allahu la ilaha illahu up to wa huwa al-aliyyul azim. You will be in the, you will have no other protector except for Allah throughout the whole of the night. No shaitan, no uh, devil. No form of shaitan will ever be able to come to you until you wake up in the morning. So, you know, I agreed with him. If he teaches me that, I'll let him go. So I let him go. <laughs> so when I let him go, I came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Prophet said, "What happened with the person that you caught last night?" 
So I said, Messenger of Allah, this person told me a few words and he said this to me. He actually told me to research out Ayat al Kursi and you know, the devil will not come to you and Allah will be your guardian throughout the night. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You know, he has said the truth to you, but he is the most wretched of liars. Well, Abu Huraira, do you know who that person was? Do you know whom Allah has sent you? Um, uh, do you know who you've been talking to for the last three nights? He said, no, Messenger of Allah. He said, that was actually the shaitan. That was actually the devil. That actually, you know, Allah had sent the devil. Uh, the devil tried to take the food three times. On the third time, the devil gave away a secret to us. And this is a Sahih Hadith in Bukhari. It's also narrated in Nasai in a different form. And in the one in Nasai, he talks about a person bothering someone in the night time. And then he teaches Abu Huraira. Uh, this, the same thing, he says, said, you will have Allah protecting you throughout the whole of the night. In fact, there is a, there is a beautiful um, story. Who's got the exact time? About two minutes, yeah? Four minutes. Three minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Good, it's getting longer. <laughs> Hopefully the Imam is delayed as well. There's a beautiful um, story, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but you, you don't have to dismiss, you don't have to believe in it if you don't want to, you don't have to dismiss it totally. But there are similar narrations from other people where um, Sayyidina Junaid al-Baghdadi, he's, uh, he Sayyidina Abdul Qadir al -Jirani, he's on his way to, for his, to seek knowledge. And there, is, there are these thieves that get hold of him. And there is money on him, so they actually say to him, you know, come on, take out what you've got. So he says, yeah, here, take it out. You see my pocket here, right here, just take it out. So they search his pockets and they don't find it. So you liar, you lie, you young boy, you lying. Where is he? He said, it's in my pocket, check it. So they check again and they, they want to beat him up because he's lying. And then in the third one, he said, come on, let's show us where it is. So he actually takes it out. So here it is. And then after they don't find it, and they say, how did you do that? He said, it was here. He said, what did you do? He said, no, my mom just taught me how to put it. And I just recited how to put it. I read it. I just never saw it. So those bandits actually did Toba from what they what they did and they became you know, people who were on the path after that. Um, <clears throat> and then separate hadith uh, of the Prophet he specifically talks about jinns and he says that Ayatul Kursi is the one that will actually protect you. He says to a particular Sahabi to actually say, you know, the time doesn't allow him to go through the full hadith. But um, uh, in terms of uh, a jinn, and uh, you know, there's, a, there's a particular hadith where a person comes to the Prophet and he says that I've been overpowered by a jinn. And you know, Rasulullah he gives uh, Ayatul Kursi to actually recite this. So anyway, the, the last, uh, there are other hadith that are very similar to the one that I've just quoted. I'm not going to go through any other hadith. What I want to say is, from today, inshallah, from this Isha, I'm going to have, you all know, who, who knows Ayatul Kursi of Baha? Put your hands up. Hands up. Hi, does my, you know, mashallah, alhamdulillah, yeah. Whoever doesn't know Ayat al-Kursi, please learn Ayat al-Kursi. It's all on your walls, in the nice frames that you've got, mashallah, and the walls everywhere. No, I about it, yeah. So whoever, whoever doesn't know it, all, it'll only take you a few minutes, perhaps uh, an hour, a couple of hours, if you know, you haven't been memorizing for a long time, all that. It's not going to take you long, and you must have heard it so many times. I'm asking you, please, that after every fourth prayer, that we recite Ayat al-Kursi, just for that, those couple of hadiths. One is you're going to be in the protection of Allah. Second is you're going to, uh, nothing will prevent you from going to Jannah except for death. death. So after every first salah, please try and make it a habit just to read Ayatul Kursi to yourself. Will you do this, inshallah? Inshallah. <laughs>